All right, so I'm going to attempt to take a, a very large uh, passage today, unlike what we've done uh, in the previous two weeks. So if you'll turn to Luke chapter 1, <clears throat> we're going to read from verse 26 all the way to verse 80, which is the end of the chapter. You, you'll remember, you know this about Luke, it, it, he has very long chapters. Um, of course, he's not the one who put the little verse numbers beside uh, the, the, the verses themselves. Uh, scribes came in and did that at a later point, uh, and we're much indebted to them. Uh, but for whatever reason, instead of, I guess it fits, it fit on a scroll. Um, they could have divided it up a little more, I suppose. But for whatever reason, uh, rather than having it be 35 chapters or, or however, they decided for it to be 24. And so that's what we have. So uh, we'll, we'll be reading a, a large portion uh, this morning. We'll finish out chapter 1, Lord willing. And so this is Luke 1, verse 26, and we'll read through verse 80. This is the word of the Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he, he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with, the, with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet on the, into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in, in spirit, 
And he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. All right. So that is the, the end of chapter 1. And so we read a large passage there. Um, so there in verse uh, uh, tw- 28, 26, yeah, 26, um, uh, we read, In the sixth month. Um, and then later on, chap- uh, chapter 1, verse 36, uh, uh, we read, um, And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her. So the sixth month there in verse 26 is a reference to um, Elizabeth's uh, uh, pregnancy. It's a re- reference to the fact that she's in the sixth month of her pregnancy. Um, and, and so we have, a, we have a pretty good sense of where things are. So, so Mary, uh, at this point, uh, by the time she leaves uh, uh, visiting Elizabeth, she will be three months pregnant with Jesus. Um, and we talked a little bit last week about the, the idea, you know, that, that you know, a, a December birth for Christ is not really that uh, out of uh, the realm of possibility. In fact, it was very quite possible that, that he was born uh, in December and even, in fact, around uh, December 25th, somewhere around there. Um, so, um, so Gabriel... He visited Elizabeth. He made this announcement to Elizabeth about the fact that she, uh, or announcement to Zechariah, rather, about the fact that, that his wife, Elizabeth, would conceive and bear a son. And then, uh, then Gabriel, uh, the same angel, uh, comes from the Lord, um, from heaven. He's sent by God to tell Mary that she, too, will bear a son. Um, and, and Gabriel tells her that he is going to be, uh, uh, well, I guess in verse 27, we read, Luke tells us that Joseph was of the house of David. What, what's the significance? What's the importance of the, the baby that Mary is going to give birth to being of the house of David? Why is it mentioned? And this is going to become a, a major theme in Luke uh, in the coming chapters. Why is it such a big deal? I mean, this is kind of a, this may be a no-brainer, but it may not be a no-brainer to some of you. So we want to make sure we understand why this is such a big deal. This is the first mention that Jesus is of, of the house of David. Josh, you look like you're ready. Fulfills the prophecy. Which one? Uh, One is that David's throne would be forever. Mm. And I can't can't remember all of the prophecies in the Old Testament as far as which ones when they started talking about Mm -hmm. David. But, I mean, yeah, you, yeah, you nailed it. In fact, this is my notes. Um, Who would like to read? Somebody turn to Second Samuel seven and read verses ten to seventeen. Second Samuel seven verses ten to seventeen. So yeah, Josh, he was right on it. That's, I mean, this is, a, this is very important. This is, the, this is the promise that the Lord, it's a covenant that God makes with David. David is, he's about to do something big, and God says no. What is, it, what is David about to do that God says, no, nah, don't, don't do that? He's going to build the temple. He, he, David is he's re, he's at rest from all of his enemies. Um, he's got his own house. It's a nice palace. Um, and he wants to build the Lord a house. And God says Nay. <laughs> um, so somebody, who's got it? Who's got that passage in front of them can read it for us? Second Samuel 7, 10 to 17. Oh, Monica? Okay. Um, and I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may dwell on their, in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make, make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne, your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Yeah, thank you. So, um, what is there a way in which that prophecy, that it's not a prophecy, it's coming straight from uh, the Lord, uh, the Lord, well, the Lord, I'm sorry, the the word of the Lord did come to David through Nathan. So it is a prophecy through Nathan. It wasn't direct revelation to David. Um, 
Is there a sense in which that prophecy is fulfilled um, in an initial way? And if so, by whom? Who, who does God choose to actually build the temple? Solomon. Solomon. And so there, often you'll see this in, in prophecies in the Bible, Old Testament prophecies. There's an initial fulfillment that's, that's really, it's not a full fulfillment. It's not the fulfillment, but it's initial, an initial fulfillment. Um, and so, so we have to understand um, uh, this, this verse, I think, um, verse 14. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men. Solomon committed many iniquities. Jesus, the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy, committed no iniquities. Now, we could understand in a theological sense that, that though he did not commit iniqu- iniquities, um, iniquities were, were um, imputed to him, that they were reckoned as his own. You could see it that way. But I think there's, a, there's an initial temporal fulfillment in, in Solomon. But, but you, know, you, you go through First and Second Kings, and you very quickly realize that Solomon is not the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy, that it applies to, it's, it's pointing, it's speaking of someone who is greater than Solomon, who is after Solomon, who, who will come eventually. And, and the language such as, um, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's verse 13 of Second, uh, Second Samuel 7. Um, uh, and so, yeah, Solomon's going to come after. Solomon's a great king um, in his own right. Um, uh, he, uh, but, but Solomon is not the ultimate fulfillment of this. And so, uh, so uh, the house of David is, is uh, referenced in verse 27, but also, um, I believe, comes back up. Well, I've probably got a little more in my notes. Uh, but the fact that he's of the house of David, yeah. Um, then again, in verse 32, he'll be great and will be called the son of the most high and of the Lord God will give it to him the throne of his father, David. Um, and so um, there is an importance to the fact that he is descended of David, that the son of Mary, uh, the son of God, is also a descendant of, of David. And it's a fulfillment initially of, of the, this prophecy, this first prophecy given uh, to David by, uh, by Nathan. Uh, and there are, there are many other, as Josh alluded to, many other prophecies that, that talk about this. Um, so... Uh, Gabriel says to Mary, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And then we read that in verse 29, she was greatly troubled at the saying, tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Um, what, about, what about this greeting? What, I mean, what, would have, what was so scary about this greeting? <laughs> um, was it the greeting itself? It seems to be. It's not just the fact that this angelic being has appeared before Mary and is speaking to her, but there's something about this greeting that scares her. What, what might it have been? Lord, yeah, the Lord is with you. <laughs> um, what does that mean? Yeah. Uh, gre- greetings, oh, oh favored one. Um, you know, what does that mean? It's vague. It's, it's vague, and, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it would be, I mean, imagine, again, you know, I've said this before. She's a 12 to 14-year-old girl, probably. I mean, at the, the age of majority in Jewish culture was around 12, um, and, and when, when a girl reached childbearing age, at whatever point that was, then she was marryable. Um, and I, that kind of, you know, that, that astonishes us. Our way of thinking is very different. Um, and um, the culture was different. Um, I don't think we in 21st century can, I don't think we ought to look back on that culture and say, well, that is, there's something morally wrong with that. Nor should we look to that culture to judge our own. Um, uh, in other words, don't look to that culture. Well, they married 12 to 14 year old girls off. There's nothing wrong with us doing that today. You, 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 do you, you see what I'm saying? I'm not saying that's a good thing. That's, no, we're, it's okay that we wait, that the legal uh, age for marriage is, is much older, and we regard these pre-adolescent or, or you know, adolescent girls as, as not being marriable, marriageable. Um, cultural, cultural norms shift. Um, I don't think we, we don't need to look back on that day with judgment, with a jaundiced eye and, and talk about how bad they were, but neither do we need to take those cultural norms as prescriptive for our own. Um, there are good reasons why we have laws in place that, that you know, that set a legal age um, for marriage and a legal age, you know, the, the um, you know, the, the statutory rape laws and things like that. It's a good thing. So, you know, I've, I've, I guess I'm saying it because I just see some things and I'm kind of astounded 
at some of the logic that people use nowadays to try to justify um, inappropriate behavior. And I just want to, I don't want you using this passage or what I'm saying about her being very young uh, to say, oh, well, let's see, it's, it was okay in the Bible. It's okay for us. Um, it's just, it's just the way it was. Um, and, and so uh, Mary is, she is a, a, a girl, um, not a, not a, by our standards, not a woman. She's young, although I would hazard to guess she's probably more mature than your average 12, 13, 14 year old would be today. Um, uh, I don't think there was a period of extended adolescence that, uh, that youth went through in that day the way that they do now. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's just a different culture. Um, so I'm not looking back on that with, with, uh, with judgment. Um, he, uh, Gabriel says in verse 30, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with what I think it means. I'm going to ask you, what do you think it means? What does it mean that she found favor with God? And I'll tell you if you're wrong. <laughs> what, what do you think it means? She found favor with God. You want to take a stab at it? She was elected or chosen by God. She was elected or chosen by God. Why? That's the, that's the good Calvinistic uh, textbook answer. <laughs> it was his choice. It was his choice. Okay, all right. Yeah. He may have thought, well, what did I do to get earned this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Th th see, I, I appreciate your, your explanation there. So the word there in Greek uh, for favor is the word charis. Does anybody know what that word means? Grace. Right. Yeah, grace. And so uh, um, uh, when he says this, uh, Bach uh, in his commentary, Daryl Bach, I think he was a professor at DTS, if I remember correctly. I don't know if he still is or not, but he's got, he's got a huge two-volume commentary on Luke, and he says, as, as a, as an exp in the Old Testament, as an expression of divine working favor, I'm sorry, divine working, comma, favor signifies God's gracious choice of someone through whom God does something special. However, here, in this, fa here this favor is announced without any, any hint, hint of a request. Um, it, it is freely bestowed. Mary is about to receive freely the special favor of God. She's a picture of those who receive God's grace on the basis of his kind initiative. And so, there's, there's nothing in the passage to suggest that, that because, Mary, because Mary was such a virtuous, uh, promising young woman, God saw, she, she, you know, the old, the old uh, 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 sound of music, I must have done something good kind of thing. God saw something in her and chose her, right? There's nothing to suggest that. However, I think we can, you know, we, we want to be careful. Again, we're, we're trying to find... Um, a balanced view, right? We don't want to. We don't want to slip over into the the, this, the veneration of, of Mary, Mariology or Mariolatry. Um, um, but neither do we want to go so far in the other direction that we denigrate this young woman. Um, there's no reason to think she wasn't a virtuous young woman. In fact, we know that her her virtue was intact. Um, based on what we read here in this narrative and in Matthew, so we know that she was was virtu virtuous, at least in certain ways. There's no reason to think she wasn't a godly young woman, um, not just a, uh, a Jew in name only, um, but that she was, she was a, you know, it, it stands to reason that God the Father would send his son to someone who was actually an observant, godly, pious Jew. Um, but all that being said, it wasn't, he didn't do this because she was such a great person. Um, she wasn't favored by God because of what she did and she became his favorite. Yeah, Suzanne. Well, he knew her. Mm-hmm, yeah. He knew where she was going to be mm -hmm. and who she was going to be mm -hmm. even when she got older. Yeah. I mean, he knew that. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, getting back to what Terry, I mean, he foreordained, like, like, before the foundations of the Lord, he, he, he foreordained that this, this girl Mary would, uh, would be the, the mother of the Son of God. Um, yeah, Russell. I don't know how many people statistically are from Bethlehem and from the house of David. Uh -huh. And during this time frame when it happened, yeah, kind of narrows it down quite a bit. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does. Um, so, yeah, it's just a, um, yeah, it, it's just a picture. You know, again, we're finding that balance, but, but um, appreciating Mary 
the woman that she was, the woman that she became, um, and you know, just being thankful that you know she she did serve the Lord um, and did and, and and her response to what Gabriel says is one of of faith. Um, Gabriel tells her in verse 31, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And Mary asks a very pertinent question of Gabriel in verse 34. How will this be since I'm a virgin? Um, the, the, the Greek there is, it's, uh, how will this be because I have not known a man? Um, and it's the, the word for no, it's the standard word for, word for no, gnosko, and it's in the present tense. Um, Catholics will take that, and they will, it's interesting that they, promote the perpetual virginity of, of Mary, which is, a, you know, if you're not aware of that, it's a very strange idea. But again, it's in order to preserve her virtue uh, for perpetuity. And they point to this verse and say, see, I, I do not know a man, um, almost as if it's in the future tense, and it's not. It's present tense. She does not presently, she has not known a man. She, in other words, she has not had sexual relations with her betrothed. Um, so how in the world is something like this going to happen? Yeah, Wayne. One of the things also they use that for is why Christ was sinless. Mm -hmm. So she had to be sinless. Yeah, and so she also was immaculately conceived. Yeah. Yeah. So, and of course, they don't say about her parents. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But one thing I was thinking about is, you know, you go throughout, you know, the Old Testament of who had favor with God mm -hmm. was through righteousness through the fact that they looked forward to yeah. the coming of the Messiah. Right. And she most likely did as well. She mm -hmm. had the faith that was given to her mm -hmm. by God, the Holy Spirit, and he had prepared her for that moment. Yeah, that's a good point. And yeah, we talked about that. Was it last week with Zechariah that he was regarded as a righteous man? What 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 was he? Well, he 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 did what he was obedient. Um, uh, he trusted in the promise, and he and he did that which was required of him. Um, you know, we we do, we have to be so careful. We you know very grace based. That um, you know it's not about my obedience. So no, it doesn't keep you in the covenant. You're not going to lose your status before God if you're disobedient. But you have to ask the question: If you're disobedient, why are you disobedient? What's going on there? Um, faith produces fruit. Hey, you were disobedient. Uh, David would have been out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, ago. exactly. Yeah, d yeah, and everybody, yeah, everybody else, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so Mary just asks, um, how can this be since I'm virgin? Notice this wasn't a question formed out of unbelief. Mary simply can't understand how it can happen. She doesn't ask for a sign the way that Zechariah did. He wants a sign. Show me how this will be. Um, or how, how shall I know this is basically what he says. She simply asks, how will this be? And so Gabriel responds in verse 35, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, that, in that phrase, you, can, you, you don't have to sexualize this. And, I, and some people do, and it's weird, okay? It's weird. And, and you don't have to. There's nothing sexual about this. Um, God created Adam from the dust and breathed life into him. And created Eve from his rib. Um, it's a supernatural act that is being talked about here, but but again, some of the things you read by people, and and they and it's weird, okay. And and if <laughs> I'm just telling, you, make it clear, there's a line here we draw. You don't. It, it, this is not a. This was not some kind of strange supernatural sexual activity that was going on here. Um, the the word used for overshadow is interesting. It's in the Greek Old Testament. Uh, to, to refer to the Shekinah cloud that rested on the tabernacle, but also it refers to God's presence in, in protecting his people. And so somebody, if somebody would, please turn to Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 and 35, and read that for us. Exodus 40, 34 and 35. Who's got it? Anybody got a volunteer? Who's quick? Somebody must be. Who's ready? Nolan, you ready? You got <laughs> yeah. Sorry, he gave me a look and I thought, all right, Nolan's ready. And then <laughs> he had to hand off the baby. So, <laughs> uh, so 34 and 38? Uh, just 34 and 35, yeah. So 
So yeah, that, the, the language there of, of covered the tent of meeting, uh, the cloud settled on it. That's the, that's the, that's the word that's translated in Luke uh, 1 as overshadowed. That this is, so it's, the, I mean, I don't think we need to try to understand how it all had, the mechanics of it. But just, this was a supernatural act. Um, and and, it, and it, it happened to Mary and, you know, the Holy Spirit caused her uh, to conceive a child. Um, so the other passage we could go to, we'll just leave it, leave it at that. But what is the, and again, this is another one that, that, that may be a no-brainer to some and not to others, but what is the theological significance of Jesus being born to a virgin? Why, do we, why is it so important that we maintain the virgin birth of Christ? Who can explain it in a, in a, in a simple way? It's a prophecy, yeah. But also, it's the miraculous. And he had to be the son of God, mm-hmm. as well as the son of man. Yeah, so the prophecy, Isaiah 7, 14, the virgin will conceive. Um, and also, as Julie said, that, that he had to be the son of God as well as the son of man. And in order to do so, uh, why, did, why does that rule out the virgin birth? Well, he could not have been conceived by ordinary means, uh, you know, by Joseph um, being the, the literal biological father of Jesus. Josh, you, were you about to say? Well, is it also partly what Paul says in Romans 5, in Adam all sin, and mm-hmm. so we want Jesus to not be in the of yeah. Adam? That's right, yeah. That, that's a very important, and that, that really, um, in Adam all sinned, everybody save one um, is a descendant of Adam in the, in the ordinary way, um, but Jesus is referred to as the second Adam. Um, he's come to, to undo uh, or, or maybe to succeed where Adam failed uh, is, a, is a way to put it. Um, he, uh, there, there are a lot of people, really a lot of people, you know, so, so reading through this and, and preparing for this, um, Daryl Bach, who's a, a fairly conservative theologian, um, you know, he points out that there's still a few who like in terms of scholars and commentators who believe in the virgin birth of Jesus, which is really kind of sad when you think about it, that in, that in the, the academic world, um, so many have just kind of abandoned this and regard it as non-essential. Or at the very least, they say, well, it doesn't, you know, um, it's really not what Luke is getting at here. Or it's just Luke and Matthew. They were written later, and they added this whole virgin birth notion to it. Um, but but it's it is essential. Um, it's essential that Jesus is not he's not conceived. He's not he didn't come about by means of ordinary generation. That his that his generation was extraordinary, it was supernatural. Um, that his that his conception truly was miraculous. So we speak of the miracle of of of, of birth. You know the miracle of children. And I don't mean to take away from that at all. Um, but but in Jesus's case, this is this is. Anything but ordinary. Yeah, Russell. How does Luke know it's Gabriel? How does he know it was Gabriel? Well, he announced, Gabriel announces it. So Luke is told. Yeah, Luke is told by, he's probably told by Mary, but we're not. Oh, okay. So he, he did his research. Gabriel tells Mary. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Well, that's a good point. He announces to Zechariah that he is, uh, that he's Gabriel. Let's see, does he, I don't know if he explicitly says it to Mary or not. Um, I guess it's not explicitly there that, that Gabriel announces himself, um, but he Luke knows. Zechariah. Yeah, yeah, he tells that Zechariah. And they got the and, and say, "Oh yeah, this is the same guy." Yeah, probably so. When Mary lives, but somehow uh, Luke knows. We yeah, and we know, and yeah. So, were you going somewhere with that, <laughs> or was that just a? Uh, well, I've just been thinking about the whole thing, and the other part of it is the overshadow. Uh, it seems like it is that. Two different parts of God when it talks about in the verse where mm-hmm. Mary is uh, becomes a child because mm-hmm. of God. It seems like it's two different parts. Two different. Let's well, talk about the Holy Spirit. I don't know if that's what you're getting yeah, at. Or, yeah. Say that exactly. It says, uh, so the Holy Spirit will come upon you. That power of the Most High will overshadow you. Yeah, the, the yeah. Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will. Mm-hmm. It seems like it's two different. 
No, well, I mean, I, I see how you could you could take it that way potentially, but it's speaking because the Holy Spirit is the Most High God, um, but but He is the person of the Trinity who, to, who is active in the conception of. So the third person of the Trinity is active in the conception of the second person of the Trinity in human flesh. Um, so there, all there's three a, together. but all three have the power of the Most High God. Yeah. Um, to, to bring the child about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they share, so the persons of the Trinity share in the power and the glory. They're equal in power and in glory. And so it's not as if the Holy Spirit is working, but the power of the Father is, is um, uh, uh, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. It's, uh, speaking of the, the, the activity the, the, that's taking place is, is the work in this particular case of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so the power, that power that's being talked about there is, is um, is an attribute of all persons of the Trinity because they are essentially one. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Does that help, does it, or does that I muddle things more? The yes. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's particular operations of the Holy Spirit in this work, and yet he's still described with the language that that I think ordinary maybe. Is, is being described as having that same the same power and uh, uh, yeah the power of the Most High yeah yeah, that makes more sense. yeah Julie you were you were raising well, your hand too I, I think you answered my question it was, mm -hmm. as y'all were talking I was thinking about Jesus' baptism where we see the three forms yes yeah <clears throat> and the, the Holy Spirit and I have never mm -hmm. noticed that in the passage yeah the same thing. Mm -hmm. yep yeah that's true that there's a, even at the <laughs> Yeah, at the beginning of his life and the beginning of his public ministry, you see, at least here I think it's a little more implicit, but you, you can see the activity of all three persons of the, of the Godhead. Um, yeah, the, you know, uh, yeah, John. I don't know if it got mentioned in passing, but it also, under, uh, the fact that she was a virgin also underscores the, uh, the way it was stated in the, the first gospel, Genesis 3.15. Mm -hmm. And I just closed it, you know, the woman. <laughs> Right. He's referred to as the, the one that would crush the serpent's head was the seed of the woman. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that you know, this underscores the fact that Jesus was her offspring, not Joseph's. Right. He is called the son of God. He is called the son of David in mm -hmm. a broader sense. But yeah. he's the seed of the woman. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a very good point. Um, now, that reminded me, I wanted to read to you something from... Um, it doesn't exactly touch on that, John, but it's, it's kind of close. I'm going to read you. This is from... Um, this is a great book. I don't think we have it in the library yet, but it's Machen's uh, book called The Virgin Birth of Christ. Oh, we do. Okay, thank you. It's in the library. Um, so he writes this, The truth is that in the New Testament, Jesus is presented in the narratives of the virgin birth as belonging to the house of David, just as truly as if he were in a physical sense the son of Joseph. He was a gift of God to the Davidic house, not less truly, but on the contrary, in a more wonderful way, than if he had been descended from David by ordinary generation. Who can say that this New Testament representation is invalid? The promises to David were truly fulfilled if they were fulfilled in accordance with the views of those to whom they were originally given. So what, what makes it, the context of this is we don't know for certain that Mary was a descendant of David. It's possible, but it's not, it's not clearly stated in the same way that it is of Joseph, that he's of the house of David. So it's not clearly stated that, if, that Mary is of the house of David um, and so, uh, so Mason is just saying, okay, so even if Mary isn't a descendant of David, he, he allows for that possibility, but he also understands that it's not explicitly in the text. So even if she's not a descendant of David, that doesn't somehow make Jesus, who is not the biological son of Joseph, it doesn't make him any less a son of David. Why? Because he truly is the son of David. Um, um, he, because he's the one who was promised in 2 Samuel 7. Um, and, and he is he's the true fulfillment of that promise in a way that no one else is. And so he is, he is more, uh, as he says, that the promises to David were more truly fulfilled if they were fulfilled in accordance with the views of those to whom they were originally given. Um, so he truly, he's the true son of David in a way that no one else ever was, ever has been. Um, so uh, um, Mary, in response to this, I love her response. Um, all, she's, she's overwhelmed. She's frightened. 
Uh, and, and all she says in verse 38 is, behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Um, if, we, if, if we too could have a similar response when the Lord calls us to difficult things, um, we would be, what a different, what a different world this, uh, this world would be. Um, that's a, it's a humble, um, submissive response to what she's been told. And uh, it's truly remarkable. Yeah, Eddie. Um, how much more fear do you think you would have in a situation like that when someone's telling you don't fear? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't, yeah, usually don't fear. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, yeah, it could be that Gabriel was saying, don't, don't, don't be afraid of this, just me coming. You know, what's about to, <laughs> what I'm about to tell you is going to, um, yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> um, you know, this may be a stretch, but if you don't believe in the virgin birth, you, I, I think you're almost questioning yeah, I mean, you're, yeah, you're, you're certainly questioning the, um, the divinity of Jesus Christ. Um, you're, 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 you're coming to a sub-Trinitarian view of the incarnation of Christ. So all you have, if, if he is not conceived in a supernatural way by the Holy Spirit, then, then you're left with what are your what are your choices? Adoptionism, where uh, God the Father chooses this human being to be His Son and sort of makes Him divine somehow. Uh, you know, there maybe is another way, but yeah, you're right. It does absolutely not only it calls into question the doctrine of the Trinity, but certainly the divinity of Jesus Christ. And and you know, we could spend a lot of time talking about that, um, what that means for our faith. Yeah, Wayne. Well, it kind of goes to. The third and fourth ecumenical councils, mm -hmm. the definition of council mm -hmm. against Nestorianism, because like you said, this is something that gets screwed up a lot of folks mm -hmm. in regards to was he truly divine? You know, that's what they, they turn around and said, you know, virgin birth, mother of God versus mm -hmm. mother of Christ. Yeah. Because the emphasis in regards to the divinity of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it does go to adoptionism. Right. Yes. Yeah. Heresy yeah. That yeah, that's right. Yeah, hey, uh, Ray. Ray, nice to meet you, Ray. Nice to meet you all, too. Well, I think that an underlying issue from there is that people really don't understand, those that talk against the virgin birth, don't understand the importance of him having not be from Adam's seed. Mm -hmm. Because from there is where original sin Yes, was. yeah. So it's important for him to be the second Adam, the better mm -hmm. Adam. Yeah. And they're completely missing that whole portion yeah. of it. Yeah, that, and I appreciate you bringing us back to that because that's that's the that's the ultimate most. I mean, theologically, the most important part of it is that if he is if he does, if he is a descendant of Adam by ordinary generation, he carries with him the same original sin that the rest of us do. Um, I mean, he's an ordinary human being; he can't save if he's not God in the flesh. And if he's God in the flesh, he can't have sin. He can't. In other words, sin can't be resident in, or the, the, the sinfulness, I guess, the estate of sin. He can't carry that, that sin nature. And that's, that's where he, while, while our sins were put upon him on the cross, he didn't have a sin nature. The, the, those sinfulness is not, is not native or natural to Christ. You were talking about this commentary that refers to a few scholars who still believe in the virgin birth. <laughs> and what's so strange is that Text is, seems pretty straightforward mm -hmm. to me here, mm -hmm. and so all of these attempts to <laughs> make it more complicated or to explain away, basically just explain away a miracle. Mm -hmm. it, it just makes me wonder, like, why? Like, if you want to say <coughs> this, why do you need to revise it? Yeah. And I know that and this is just true. In academia, there is a culture uh, in every field of study I'm aware of, mm. of trying to come up with novel explanations for things, yeah. try to be revolutionary somehow, <laughs> right. just repeating what somebody else said doesn't make it famous. Right. <clears throat> yeah. There are some cultural pressures to mm -hmm. reimagine stuff, but this is, either this happened or it didn't happen. Yeah. And if you're not okay with this, are you okay with feeding 5,000 people? Or are you okay yeah. with parting the rest? Like, like, yeah. What do you have left? Yeah, and many, and yeah, many, this. This yeah, many, many would say no, none of it happened, and they, you know, they they try the, the John Shelby Spong attempts to just provide naturalistic 
explanations for everything. Oh, he didn't walk on water. There was a there was a, a land or something, you know, some kind of just beneath the surface or whatever, um, or some kind of illusion, optical illusion or something. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no supernaturalism whatsoever. And what do you have? I mean, Christianity is. What do you have if there's no supernatural? There's you don't. I mean, it's 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 false. We, why believe it? <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and I think we're we're at, we're getting to that point where life would be a whole lot easier if we didn't believe these crazy things. I put them in air quotes, you know, because yeah, we'd be accepted by the world. We'd be, you know, um, yeah, yeah. Russell's giving a good belly laugh. There is true. I mean. We we kind of bring you know we're gonna there's a point that probably will happen it seems you know we're gonna bring the derision upon ourselves the fact we do believe such a crazy notion and people do they mock it already um, they mock it now um, well it goes back to the formation of the old PC yeah that's right yeah the liberalism that had mm-hmm. come into the PC yeah. USA and just blew yeah that's why Major was writing this book is because this is a major issue um, and you know and this, you know in many ways I think that you know Machen and others who were fighting that fight they didn't they didn't win the day not in terms of the wider church um uh, all right um we're going to make it through verse 80 <laughs> um so what's the significance of mary's interaction with elizabeth what what is mary, mary uh, goes to visit elizabeth uh six months pregnant what happens what's the significance of it in a nutshell i'm making y'all do my job for me um john leaps mary uh, sorry elizabeth says, whoa, you know, and what, is, what does Elizabeth say to Mary? It's pretty significant what she says. Um, she says, um, I'll, I'll just read it. Uh, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, and why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? What does that, what does that show that Elizabeth understands? Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah, she understands Jesus, yeah. That, yeah, the, the mother of my Lord is here. What? <laughs> What did I do to deserve this? What's going on? Um, uh, for behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And, and so there's that, there's this, I, I, oh, I've got this great quote. I put it in my notes. Um, uh, this is from one of the little study books I have. John was the greatest prophet of the old, old covenant, the one called to announce the coming of the Christ. Jesus was the Christ, the Lord of the new covenant. So when Mary met Elizabeth, the covenants connected. Uh, it was just an interesting thing to think about. These two, the old and new covenants, have came together at that moment. Um, there's no record of, of John and Jesus interacting from that point until the point of his his baptism, his public ministry. I mean, they're, they're, it's possible they cross paths. Um, although it does say that John he went to live in the wilderness. Um, uh, it sounds like he lived there, you know, for for most of his life. Um, so, all right. Um, all right, at this point, everybody have a Psalter hymnal? We've only got a minute. Who doesn't have a Psalter hymnal? Who doesn't have a Psalter hymnal? Um, Sorry. What's that? There's a pink group back here. Oh, yeah, bring it in. Bring it in. Bring it in. Sing it if you want to come through. We'll close it out. I've got a couple more things I want to read from my notes. Let's come on in. We're singing the Song of Mary. Anybody need... Were you out of sulfur animals back there? I like to sing in my Sunday school classes. So. Um. All right, it's 201. Uh, five verse, so we this is this is otherwise known as uh, three hundred one. Sorry, I can't, yeah, the Psalter hymnal is weird in that the Christmas hymns aren't around the two the early two hundreds. So three hundred and one in the Psalter hymnal, Song of Mary. This is otherwise known as the Magnificat, um, and it's really a beautiful uh, it's a beautiful song, and I think it's set to a really pretty tune. So we've sung we sung this a time or two um, uh, in the last year or so, um, but the tune I think you'll recognize it. So let's sing all five of three hundred one.
put those back up on the uh, the table and we'll put them away. Just a couple of things. Um, Mary re- remained with Elizabeth until about the time of John's birth, um, then returned to Nazareth. By that time, she's about three months pregnant, Mary is. Um, on the day of John's circumcision, Zechariah and Elizabeth's friends and neighbors were about to call the baby's boy Zechariah, but Elizabeth told them his name would be John. The neighbors were incredulous. You don't have anybody in your family named John. What's up with that? And so Talk to Zechariah, and Zechariah says, "Give me a t-, or you know motions for them to give him a writing tablet." He writes, "His name is John." <laughs> He's very insistent on this, um, and as soon as he does that, he re- he regained his ability to speak. And his first words that he says after nine months of silence, the first thing that comes out of his mouth is, "He gives thanks and praise to God." He he glorifies him, um, and uh, and then he uh, he says. Uh, um, Father, Father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied. And then he gives this song. And I was thinking about singing this one. I knew it would be too much and we're definitely out of time. But, but reading that prophecy, and specifically verses 76 to 79, he says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us on high, from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the, into the way of peace. What, a, what an amazing and incredible prophecy that Zechariah gives about his son. Um, John is, is, he's just the forerunner, uh, but he is the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. Why? Not necessarily because he was better than, but it's because of who he preceded immediately. Who he preceded. The, the one uh, who's coming, he was destined, created to announce. And so, so John is a remarkable figure simply for the fact that the Lord used him uh, to prepare the way for the coming of the Most High, the coming of the Son of God.